we're right on schedule. So we have time for q and A. I I think we've had a lot of information to digest, and I would invite people to come up to the microphones to uh, ponder their, their questions. Um, and so we will go, let's see if the, these guys are ready. Uh, we'll start with uh, Linda Zhang. Hello, Linda Zhang from New York. Thank you for those two lovely talks. They were very uh, intriguing and emotionally charged, for sure. Um, I have two questions. One is, I see that a lot of the examples that you gave were from more crisis management and like uh, taking action under duress. And I wonder why is, is that where this, um, I guess, the study of leadership comes from? And two, do you, how do you see that applying to day-to-day -day leadership? Like, is it just the same but less glamorous, or is, do you see something different? So that's a great question. And in one hour and a whole semester, I gave you a few highlights. Um, actually, what, we, what we're finding, again, in, in teaching our students and then in being with people in field situations, is that if you practice these principles on an everyday basis, including getting out of the basement if you're in a tough situation. That happens every day. Um, understanding complex situations, whether it's a staff situation or a crisis situation, every day. And then if you're effectively leading down, leading up, leading across, and leading beyond, and working on the notion of how can I make you a success. If you do that every day, the moment the crisis hits, you'll be able to pivot and respond well. And I, I think we're all in a bit of shock uh, in this country uh, right now. There are more crises than we're dealing with today than ever before. And you know what leaders are telling us is that you just have to have that capacity to pivot uh, in, in, into a crisis situation at any moment. And being able to practice these methods and principles every day allows you to do that quick pivot. For the record, you can use this if you've got a personnel problem that can send you to the basement if you've got a budget problem that could send you to the basement, or Congress just passed a new piece of legislation that will take us all to the basement. So th the premise here, and um, yes, I gave you examples from crises. Uh, uh, um, these are principles and these are methods that you can use every day so that when you know, that change happens, you're ready. Yeah. You, you know, one of the things we noticed on your slides that I thought was missing was never send an email from the basement. Yeah. That would be that would be sage advice. Pascal. Yes. Uh, Pascal Fukushima I'm from Kaiser Permanente. Thank you both for a wonderful t uh, talk. I finally understand in a lot of ways why a lot of things don't work in my department. So that I think I took it the advice that way, and it's very interesting. John, uh, I have a question for you. you. The most intriguing thing that you said for me was that there's a difference between management and leadership. And in a big organization like mine where there's 20,000 people, I don't see the leadership very much. All I see is management. So it's kind of sort of depressing. Um, how often does the leadership really have to show up? to actually be effective. I mean, what, you know, I, I, I may be able to see the leadership once a year, and it's in a didactic form where you don't interact, they just tell you. Is it important, right, or is a, management enough? Yeah, it is, it's essential. And, um, you know, uh, I, I come from the school of thought that we should never really bring in consultants, that, that um, the job of the leader is to always go to the place of value in the front lines in the Gemba and spend time there. And um, the solutions to all our problems are always inside the organization, but they're buried. And the job of, of, of that, you know, executive leadership is to, is to not do tours and, you know, to, to pay lip service to it or just show their face and be visible uh, or management by walking around, but in fact to really spend time asking and listening to do that lucid diagnosis and to be able to, every time you want to develop a new agenda to solve problems you know you should take it should take two to three months to develop um, a group of people who have you know understood what these problems are and um, have tested it thought about it and developed it developed a rationale and then a set of goals in the next nine months developing it and the job of the leaders is to go back in there and to be working with them all the time. Now, the other thing I just want to say is that when I talk about leadership, it's, I'm not talking about executives. I'm talking about you, all of you. And that those 20,000 people or whatever the number was, uh, it, it doesn't matter. W managers with clinical backgrounds will run much, much, much better 
better performing organizations if they've had some training. And um, just when, uh, the same way that biology and chemistry became biochemistry in the 20th century, the powerful science for us now is biomedical sciences joining forces with management science. And this new science of medicine and management is real. And it's as it's happening in Intermountain and a lot of places around the world, but it's not taught in business school and it's not taught in medical school. And um, it's gonna be in the work that all of you do, but you have to understand some of the basic principles that are underneath it. There is an underlying science to this, the science of collective intelligence, this, um, the physics of patient flow, understanding that with big data analytics, we still have to understand the outliers because you know the study of, uh, 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 the study of performance is not interested in central tendency and statistics is only based on central tendencies. We have to understand where the outliers are, who are the best and why and study that, surface that. And again, there's an underlying science to all these things. Um, so it's not, I'm not, we're not telling you to start doing robotic surgery without some training and practice, and that's what this, I think this leadership training is about. If I, if I might, you know, one of the things that, that we found and work with people in the field is that the people who have the titles are not necessarily the leaders. Um, and there are, having spent time with you folks, there are a lot of extraordinary leaders uh, in your system, um, and and in and, and any system, uh, sometimes th those leaders are not the people with the titles, um, which is a good thing, and which also can create a lot of complexity. Yeah, John Page, John Page from New Orleans really enjoyed uh, this this whole session. It was very interesting. Um, uh, one comment and then a question. When you were talking about the, me the meta leadership, is a very interesting idea, and I th it was it was fascinating that you drawn on uh, the idea of meta research, but just your whole talk and talking about thinking your way out made me think of a, a psychology meta, that is metacognition. Mm -hmm. So in basically you're thinking about your thinking and the, you think about the leadership and how that works. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was my comment. I thought that was interesting. You use metacognition to become a meta leader. Right. Uh, the, other, the other comment and observation was that with swarm intelligence, I do a lot of work in high reliability team training and that sort of thing. And, a lot of those items touch on, in my opinion, what Salas has been doing with his se seven C's and this idea, like basically with your swarm intelligence, you're creating highly reliable teams and mm -hmm. you use all those principles. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your guys' opinion. If Is the swarm intelli uh, intelligence more than that or is it just creating high, re or, or is it just uh, creating the, the environment for a highly, reliably, highly reliable team function? So it, it, is, it is very connected to this. My mother had an expression, you know, Columbus didn't discover America, it was already here. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of these ideas are ideas that bring in other, so you have servant leadership here, you have transformation leadership, so I totally acknowledge that. Um, it, it, the interesting thing about Swarm and where this, I think, to speak to your question, is that there are a lot of examples where we humans engage in swarm-like behavior. So just as an example, uh, some, some people say their house of worship feels like a swarm of sorts. Um, or a family, uh, extended family, feels like a swarm where people are really taking care of one another. Um, so uh, the, the, the principle here is, A, how can you embed some of those instincts or leverage some of those instincts when you're dealing with a team at your hospital? Um, it's not, and I don't see this as a malicious act, this is just a matter of people want to be part. We humans are instinctually want, are social, we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves because just like the birds that are looking for sustenance and they're looking for protection, we have those instincts that do the same. And if as a leader you can create that kind of environment within your work group, you can create a pretty highly functioning and very connected team. Yeah. Matt Ritter. Hi, Matt Ritter at Walter Reed Bethesda. I wanted to start by thanking you guys and giving you an update on one of your case studies there. Uh, John O, uh, who was uh, in, in your military case, uh, was eventually promoted to colonel and then just uh, retired last year from Walter Reed where he was the chief of general surgery. So uh, oh. I've seen you present that case uh, several times. Uh, he's probably been one if he's not currently. I know he's been to the meeting. Uh, but he's a trauma surgeon now at uh, Hershey uh, uh, for uh, Penn State. Uh, but my question is, in his scenario, you know, and having talked with John about this a few times, you know, the downside, the reason you're supposed to make him expectant is if you have other patients coming in, you could potentially take out an entire asset, which would cost many people their lives. 
so, but in that scenario, him making that decision consistent with the doctrine would have likely been very unpopular with the remainder of the team. Like having been in that environment personally, everybody wants to operate on that guy. Based on your leadership strategies, are there any strategies that tend to work better when you're making a correct but largely unpopular decision? And is there any guidance that you would give to people when they're in a situation where they have to really communicate that to a team? So I think that uh, you, know, you, you want to tap into the collective intelligence of the group. And I think that uh, unless you think the group is, you know, is unable and unwilling or insecure about this, the situation that you're in, you really have no right to override the, uh, the, the views of the group. Um, uh, unless, again, they lack experience or they don't really understand some of the ramifications or they're, they're, you know, they're feeling that they don't have the efficacy to be able to get, carry this through. But short of that, I think you, you have to spend time listening to what their opinions are, respecting those opinions, and, um, and that's, a, a, I think, a far better way to go. I think, you know, the job isn't, to, you know, when you're, when you're selling your ideas, somebody has to be buying. But you can always use your authority to do that, but I don't think it's very firm ground. So I think building commitment is, it takes time, and, and, uh, and again, people get to know your style as a leader. And if you're able to adapt your style according to the situation, I don't believe there are any theories of leadership that um, are, are very uh, uh, useful or valid, no stable theories. I believe that there's just too many clinical and managerial situations and far too few variables, uh, observations, to, uh, and, and so many variables to be able to come up with a real important theory. So again, I think um, uh, the most important thing is applying this idea of of diagnosing the situation, tapping into the collective intelligence of the group, and building commitment to the goals, um, and, and strategically designing and redesigning the team so that they have very good communication, they respect each other, they have a shared goal, and they know what everybody's doing in those silos, that they have mutual knowledge and they understand this. And my colleague Jody Gattel has written a lot of really, really powerful pieces on this theory as she studied Southwest Airlines and applied it to healthcare. But, but John, what you're describing uh, isn't taught in med school and not everybody has time to get a, an MBA. When I arrived in Buffalo, there was a mid-level clinical leader who was in the process of failing and about to be castrated by the healthcare system. And I said, well, wait a second here. You made the guy in charge of a whole bunch of stuff and you gave him no training. Why are you surprised when he made an unpopular decision and failed uh, miserably? And so, you know, Brandeis is once a year. An MBA is in your program is a 16-month commitment. Where's the middle ground in, in all of this for, for people who need more? Well, I think that um, the most important thing for everyone as a leader is to get uh, feedback on what they're doing. So we all have self you know, perceptions about what we do and how we do it, team building, our ability to listen, our, you know, as a matter of fact, when, you know, I've worked with a lot of physicians, and as soon as they tell me I'm a really good listener, I know they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and usually the next thing they'll say is that, you know, I want to make, I, and it's really important that I communicate because I really want to be understood. So um, I know that someone does probably is doing a lot of talking. I think the, the most powerful thing is using, um, a, a, and there's a lot of uh, BS out there, you know, the whole romance with leadership, and we've got to be very, very careful about what we do, but there's some excellent instruments, but not all of them, and I think you've got to, I think taking one of those as a 360 where you have 12 to 15 people anonymously looking, direct reports, colleagues, uh, you know, uh, the up team that you report to, evaluating you um, in, a, in a significant and serious way, and then working with a group of other physicians in a day-long session uh, to do leadership development is a very, very powerful tool and, tool, and then doing it a year or two later and looking at the gaps. Because you know, you say, oh, my, my team building is a six out of seven, and then the team tells you that you're a three or a four. So it's an eye-opener, and if, if one person tells you that, you can ignore it, but if two, t two people tell you, that's valid enough for me to act upon it. Now, I just worked with to uh, uh, Toshiba, uh, uh, nuclear power plant engineers, just a week ago in Paris, and what was interesting was opposite to what I've seen in the work that I've done in working with clinicians, males and female leaders think they're better than they are and then the observers are a little below that. Uh, sometimes the boss thinks you're better than you think you are and there's some shifts there. 
across the board, everybody at Toshiba thought they were worse than everybody else thought they were. And I thought that that was really interesting. Instead of being um, you know, overconfident, they were all underconfident. But in general, I find that most, uh, most people are overconfident about their leadership. Without that feedback, you, know, you, don't, you don't know what you're doing until you see it through the eyes of other people. So I think that, that um, you know, one or two days with a follow-up and with not ex executive individual coaching, I don't believe in that. I believe in peer coaching. I believe all of you in, in a small group of four or five people coach each other much better than any one person I don't care what the credentials are. And I think that the job of the executive coach is to facilitate that group in a, in a full day. And, um, and I have a lot of experience doing this with literally thousands of people all over the world and, and clinical people. I have a study that I did with 400 leaders and 4,000 observers of those clinical leaders in the world using this methodology. And it's, uh, I think it works extremely well. And it's not, it's, 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 it's not that it's painless. To deprive you of that feedback is to cheat you. And yet, you know, t to read that some people think you're not, you know, especially for perfectionists, it's, not, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. So it's an eye opener. The other thing that happens is people say, oh yeah, I've, I've gotten this feedback before. This is the third time. And so what do they do with it? And they say, well, I'm pretty successful. I can just, I don't want to change. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for people is to look in the mirror and realize that when two or three people are telling them they don't listen or they interrupt at meetings or they don't really understand what people are thinking, what's on their mind, to, take, to be able to do something about that. Feedback oh, is a man, gift. Definitely. A, a, a very simple tool that can be helpful to you in a situation like that, uh, especially if you've gone to the basement, it, it's just the word consequences. So as you're reflecting, you're in a situation like that. So what are the consequences for me? You're it. Uh, in terms of w what you perceive going on and what you perceive is in the group. And then with that group of people who might be uh, expressing a variety of different opinions, and there might be a split even among that group. So as each of these different, you know, remember the cone and the cube, look at the problem. What are the consequences? And simply ask yourself first, what are the consequences that I'm going into as a leader? And then ask each of those groups, what are the consequences of what it is that you're proposing? And sometimes, especially if you're in the basement, one word as part of your toolbox can be very, very helpful. In the first month of this administration, we had a meeting in the Situation Room with National Security Council staff. And at the end of the meeting, I said, would you just let me do one thing? I just want to write the word consequences on a piece of paper and stick it up on the wall. <laughs> so whatever decisions are being made here, everybody's always um, aware of the consequences of the decision or the action or the tweet. Uh, they wouldn't let me do it. Uh, but nevertheless, I said, just keep on, keep that word in your mind because from a leadership perspective, it's not only important to understand the consequences in terms of what you're doing, it's important to help other people to understand the consequences of what they're proposing and where this might lead the group. If I could add one other thing, I think that's a really great point that you're making. I think there's always a cascade of consequences, and if you don't think about the full set of consequences, you're going to ignore, ignore low probability events, you're going to limit the search for stakeholders, you're going to focus on the short term, discount the future. So I think that's, those are some really, really powerful ways to think about the what-ifs. Um, and, and one of the things I learned is that, you know, spending uh, with a group talking about whether you're bringing in a new uh, 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 surgical procedure um, with, uh, with uh, new protocols and new methods, to spend some time with all the what ifs. What if the, what if the, what, what, what if, uh, the anesthesiology uh, changes hands? What happens if we have turnover? What if this? What if that? What if the, pa you know, what if the patient isn't ready for the procedure? The what ifs are so powerful, and then you want to think about then we'll do this, we'll do that. And so, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a heavy duty science we're talking about, but it's learning how to communicate with each other. The concepts and tools to facilitate that are what's necessary, and that's where. Leadership is not about crises all the time, but in fact, you know, a lot of simple problems that, that emerge every day. Demetrius. Uh, Dimitri Stefanidis, Indiana University. I enjoyed very much your presentations, and I have um, three questions if I'm allowed to ask three. So, so one question is an extension to what Matt asked, and I think the, the situation uh, with Dr. Orr that we saw, if the bomb had exploded and the team had died, I think most would perceive this as a lack of leadership and poor judgment. So what, this, what makes the distinction? This is my first question. Second question is uh, uh, different. I mean, um, you talked a number of times that um, um, 
you see that uh, people who are in leadership positions may not be the ones who are the true leaders. And that probably is well true. Uh, are there ways to, reliable ways to assess the good leaders? And is that really being used in different areas so that the best people perhaps go to the best positions? Because I would argue that the good leaders, if they're in the, also in the leadership position, they may have more leverage to really do good things. And my last question is, um, <clears throat> we generally uh, think uh, that uh, the collective thinking tends to be better than the individual thinking. But if, when you look at leadership, typically there's one person always at the top. What's, what are your thoughts on collective leadership, or has that been studied? Uh, is that promising? Is it something we need to start thinking along the lines of perhaps engaging more rather than relying on one individual who is a lot more likely to make mistakes? So um, do you want to talk about the uh, sure. collective, and then I'll talk about the other two. Well, first off, um, um, we, we always have a distinction when we look at complex leadership scenarios, just to answer your first question. Were they lucky or were they smart? And there's a lot of lucky that goes on in leadership. When I was watching that, that tape, they were lucky. Um, and, and one could argue that it was not smart. I won't get into that argument, but certainly as an example, we looked at a lot of what happened in the Boston Marathon bombings. It happened at 2.49. Shift change here in Boston is three. So they were able to keep the afternoon shift on and the evening shift came on, so they had double staff at all of the hospitals. Was that lucky or smart? I would argue that was lucky. So that goes to your first question. Um, regarding um, your second question, John, I'm gonna imagine you're gonna be in that, but I, but I think we always look for leaders who are adaptive, and yes, um, what we find in high-performing organizations, it's not that there's one leader on top who's running it. Rather, that leader has an investment in the development of leadership of everyone in the staff. So that leadership development is not something that happens at top. This goes back to the question of Kaiser Permanente. Uh, leadership development is something that is a value for the organization because those people who are your young, emerging leaders could very well one day be in senior leadership positions. So if you want to uh, embed certain principles and values um, uh, into your organization, you want to be developing those leaders early on because that becomes the backbone of your organization. So I guess the first question was if it exploded, what, <laughs> what you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true that sometimes um, in school we study uh, good and bad outcomes and, um, and maybe we need to look at really what's underneath it. And again, I say it's about the diagnosing the situation, that what he did step by step, st I think you, if you look at the decisions that he made, I think they were all spot on. I mean, he did get promoted, as somebody said, but that may have been for political reasons, I don't know. The, the, uh, the first thing he did was he evacuated the facility. The, and the second thing he did was he told his team that it's time to go, but he was going to stay with the patient until the unexploded ordnance uh, team came and, and they radiographed it. So again, step by step by step, he's diagnosing, he's getting factual information, he's realizing and reanalyzing the situation. Now, at, at, at what point, as they were removing it, if it had exploded, then I, you know, obviously that would have been a terrible thing. But I think up to that point, I think it, it, he did an excellent job of what a good leader should do, which is, again, to, to manage the process and to make sure that the team is being as rational as possible. At the same time, you know, they're communicating, they're respecting each other, and that's really what good leadership is. And, um, yeah, so, uh, you, you know, I think um, the idea of having multiple leaders, I think, is, is exactly what it's about. I think, again, every physician, a leader, but every leader is a collaborative follower and team player. And I think in, in the dancing guy that you were showing, right. it's, it's, the, it's the same principle, I think. Rob Lim. Uh, thank you very much again for your talks. They're excellent, very fascinating. I can give a little update on Dr. O. He and I were residents together. We wow. lived together for two <laughs> years. Um, what you saw on there is not the guy I remember from my residency days, but he's a very good clinician. Uh, he most definitely earned his rank of lieutenant colonel and would have actually gone on to full colonel if he'd stayed in, but he elected to get out. 25 minutes. Full, oh, that's right. He full colonel. And he, he definitely earned it. He, uh, 
It wasn't a political move. The other thing that he did that you didn't mention was that he gave everybody the option to leave the room and not stay. He said, look, I'm staying. The anesthesiologist said, I'm staying too. Um, and we'll take this out. And everyone said, we're here. And while it may have been not the smart thing to do in the grand scheme of the military, you know, our mission, it's not a dumb thing necessarily, not a the wrong thing to do because you're there to save the life. And so we sort of accept that risk when you go out there and uh, you, uh, you, you make that decision on the fly, not like Captain Sullenberger did in that movie. Well, my question to you is I have the, sort of the opposite problem, which you mentioned sort of with the Toshiba people, which is that I have a problem motivating people. I think there are plenty of opportunities out there. I am recognized that I am not a very intelligent person, and I may not recognize the problems, but I know I hear people talking about them, and I try to guide them along to where they need to be and give them support, but I can't get them sort of over the hump to the next step to sure. realize that this So is a, what's your theory of motivation? What drives people? Uh, well, I try to think of what I would like for someone for me to do if I was in that situation. If I had a problem, I would want to know who I should talk to to get more advice and information on it. I'd like to have a vehicle or a place to have the voice heard in an, an effective society that would make that problem seem, I guess, more legitimate. Uh, and then I would want to be able to, you know, get the support, uh, know, know that I'm going to continue to support them afterwards. Um, I, I kind of. I mean, I come across as too overbearing, like here are all these things, take it, and they might feel like you know, I'm not the right person for it. Uh, I don't know, but I have a problem, you know, I have lots of quality people I think in my organization in the military, you, you sort of get promoted even if you don't want to be into different jobs. Um, and so if you stay long enough, you will make certain rank or positions. Um, and those people maybe don't feel like they have to do to a whole heck of a lot to get there. But I think there, there's an opportunity to do that in lots of different organizations, but in the military where I am, I just have a problem saying, look, it's there, do it. It's sure, right there, let me sure. help you. Sure, I, I mean, that's easy, and again, you know, there's sort of six underlying, the science of persuasion says there's six principles, and, and being authoritative and having the authority and having expertise, those are, that's, that's one of the, of the principles of persuasion. Um, there's a, you know, the, the truth is that what you do as clinical leaders is all in the book on motivational interviewing. MI is a very, very powerful set of concepts and tools to get that motivation I think you're talking about. But the, the two important qualities you have to have as a leader is number one, um, you know, you, you've, you've got to be a listener. You've got to be somebody that can really listen, not to refute, but to understand somebody's point of view. So that the first thing you're listening for is the feeling, which is in, sometimes in the basement. And, and that way you can understand what their perceptions are and what assumptions they're making. And, um, and it's, a, it's motivational interviewing teaches you to ask these open-ended questions and then to learn how to affirm what people are, are, are telling you in your own words, not repeating what they say, and then hypothesizing in the form of a reflection in terms of what, what the situation is. That when we observe people's behavior and motivational issues, we tend to attribute them to, diff to, to things that are more observable and if you listen deeply to what they're saying, it'll be much more about how they see the situation. So I think that motivational interviewing is really about when people are angry or upset, not arguing with them, but listening and following. And as, as that, you know, the follower is actually a leader at that moment, or somebody's grieving, or it's just like giving patient too much, too much information. So I think that I would recommend that, that, that the, the secret, I think, is that learning those, some of those tools for motivational interviewing. They're very powerful. And then there's a book by Daniel Pink that's simple, and I think most people like it when they read it, called Drive. And what it does is it tries to debunk um, the old views of motivation, even though they never seem to go away. And what really drives people, as we know, are a sense of purpose, um, having autonomy and taking responsibility for outcomes, and learning and mastery, learning, you know, being on this asymptotic learning curve and getting better and better and better at what we want to do. And those three things are powerful motivators for people. What's our purpose? Why are we doing this? The why is the most powerful reason, not the what and the how. So we talk about, you know, oh, I, we have a school, we got professors, we have courses. I mean, that's not important. What's the mission? And the mission at my school, when we developed the MBA, I helped to start the MD-MBA program and the MBA, 
was knowledge advancing social justice, and we had a very powerful, and the EMBA physician program is, uh, the mission is knowledge advancing. You know, the, the Heller School for what? We have a mission. And that turned out to be very, very powerful. The problem is the students take us seriously and expect us to do it. <laughs> and so we're living in a crazy world, right, where that's not happening. When, uh, um, you know, at the, at the very bottom, the last slide I had uh, about swarm uh, leadership, uh, at the very bottom it said order beyond control. Yes. Just to speak to your motivation question. And, you know, if I were to ask how many people like to be controlled in this room, probably very few people would raise their hand. If I asked how many people like to be a part of an order, which is a way of putting a team together, most people would raise their hand. And so what, what we're finding in, in situations where it's controlling, that could uh, very well uh, uh, take away from, diminish uh, that sense of motivation. And if people feel that they're invested in and part of creating order, among a group of people who are working together, that tends to increase motivation. Um, and that's where that whole notion of you're continuously in developing leaders throughout the organization because then they're part of creating the order, the performance, and the output of the organization. I have an investment, I have buy it, I'm motivated. So, well so I'd like to end with a clinical question. <clears throat> One of the things that binds all the surgeons in the room together that sends, has sent almost everybody in the room to the basement at some time in their career is uh, audible bleeding. And as the surgeon, we are the captain of that particular team. We have anesthesia, we have nurses, we have all kinds of resources that need to stay in their lane. And what made me think of it, John, is you touched on this so briefly when you said slow time. It almost went by in a flash. Slow thinking. S slow thinking. And you talk about, Lenny, getting to your toolbox, are you guys really saying the same thing, that when you've been sent to the basement, I, I, what I saw was real commonality, different words, but real commonality. If you just take a moment to, to sort of imagine yourself in the operating room and somebody's bleeding to death, and I really never had a chance to think about it until I did Dan's team training scenario, and it was simulation, but I was so wrapped up in the moment, they had to like grab me, okay, we're done. But um, it really, true story. Um, if you just take a moment, because this is something that we all share, is this slow thinking and how to get out of the basement the next time we find ourselves with audible bleeding. Well, I mean, the, the hardest thing for us um, is, is detachment from the emotion, I think. Uh, and no matter how smart we are, when the situation uh, and the, or our construal of the situation is that we've got pressure, it could be time pressure or financial pressure, complexity, a lot of variables are novelty, it's something new we haven't experienced before, and uncertainty, there's a lack of sure knowledge about what's really going on. Under those conditions, we have a covert activation of biases that that, that bring us right to your basement, and, and that's what happens to, to, to the best teams. And the job of the leader is to find the stairs to the balcony, to detach themselves from that, to be able, by staying out of the content, then you've got to, you, again, you're managing the process, and that's, that's where you have to be. Sometimes it's just reminding yourself that you're getting upset. You know, when I drive, I try to say, oh, I'm getting angry. And by saying that somehow, it detaches me a little bit from yelling at the BMW that just cut me off. Um, the, the, the example that I gave of that surgeon in the Midwest was very, very real, and I think that really speaks as an example of what you're talking about. I, I, I like to call it, it's important for us to be smarter than your brain, because all of these things that we've been talking about are, are part of our hard wiring, and they're going to happen, and they're going to happen to other people in our department. So if we're watching ourselves, if we're able then to discipline ourselves to get out of the basement, and then to be able to get other people out of the basement too, which is why I would encourage you to, to, to share this thinking with your colleagues. Um, we just uh, taught this to a, a, an organization. There were two people who had been through the training and one person who hasn't, and something came up, and one turned to the other and said, I think we're in the basement, and the other person who didn't know what this meant actually turned to them and said, actually, I think we're on the fifth floor. <laughs> <laughs> so if this becomes common vocabulary in your ORs, and if this becomes common vocabulary in your department. It can be a tool that you can use in exactly that situation. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who would like to thank you for such an amazing session. So many of you, many of you kind of wonder why we're in Boston today. And the reason we're in Boston is I've had the privilege of doing both the Brandeis and School of Public Health programs. 
And these last three speakers I thought were so transformative that I really wanted to get them in front of you guys. So you guys did everything to get here today. Thank you so much for being here. I know you've taken away from your families and your time on a Saturday. And as you can see, we're, we're very appreciative. And many of us will continue to attend your programs. Thank you.